to introduce our featured speaker today, I'd like to ask uh, another of our board members, Dr. Hal Paz, Paz, excuse me, Hal, um, who is the executive uh, vice president and chief medical officer of Aetna to come up and make the introduction. Hal. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, Mary, for the kind introduction. It is now my great privilege to introduce our next guest speaker, Kathy Bates. Ms. Bates is an Academy Award-winning actress, advocate, and spokesperson for the Lymphatic Education and Research Network, an internationally recognized nonprofit fighting lymphedema and lymphatic disease through education, research, and advocacy. On the screen, she's known for her roles as Annie Wilkes in Misery, the unsinkable Molly Brown in Titanic, and more recently for the characters she played in American Horror Story. Off screen, Ms. Bates tirelessly raises public awareness about lymphedema and lymphatic diseases. Ms. Bates is among the estimated 10 million Americans living with lymphedema. As a Lymphatic Education and Research Network spokesperson, she actively engages with patients, policymakers, media, and the scientific community, speaking directly to researchers at scientific conferences and meeting with leaders of the American Medical Association about the importance of lymphedema education during medical school and medical training. Ms. Bates met with Senator Charles Schumer last year to advocate for federal funding for lymphedema and lymphatic disease research, which led to Senator Schumer submitting a request to the Senate Labor H Appropriations Subcommittee in support of lymphatic and lymphedema research for fiscal year 2017. So now, please join me in welcoming Ms. Kathy Bates. for that lovely introduction. I've been so looking forward to speaking to all of you, and it's quite an honor to be among so many distinguished uh, doctors and scientists today. I've been pondering um, my being here with so many of you who have accomplished so much in, in helping human beings achieve a better life. Um, and I've, I think I've uh, hit on the thread that perhaps we all share, and that is empathy. We all want to help human beings um, achieve a better life, a healthy life, and as Ali so eloquently put it just now, we want to join the workforce and, and, and uh, live a fulfilled and fulfilling existence. I'd like to thank Mary Woolley, who I was in a green dress, which is the right color I understand now. <laughs> Got to get those green um, uh, ties for my tennis shoes. Um, and I'd like to thank her staff for doing such a wonderful job to get us all here. And um, I also want to thank uh, Peter Ranke of NIH MetaLine Plus. I believe he's here today. I don't know if he was able to make it during this. Are you way back there? Okay. I, I wanted to thank you for your wonderful article. And I think everyone has a copy of that on the table. I urge you to read that. Um, and pass it on to a friend because we're trying to educate uh, the public, as Dr. Paz just said. Um, I would also like to recognize Bill Rapisi, who is our CEO of the Lymphatic Education and Research Network. And three years ago, <laughs> um, my doctor, Emily Eicher, who treats me for lymphedema, um, uh, introduced me to Bill and he got a tooth around my ankle, <laughs> a couple of teeth around my ankle. And so um, I'm here directly because of Bill. I would also like to thank and, and recognize Nancy Gray of the Gordon Research Conference for, for so generously letting me speak at the conference last year and opening the door for patients uh, to come and speak to researchers. Um, 
And I would also like to recognize Dr. Stan Roxon, who couldn't be today, couldn't be here, of the uh, Stanford Center for Lymphedema and um, Venous Disorders. Um, and also I'd like to uh, recognize Steve Palmer, who has been such a wonderful uh, a man to video, to video all of our patients. We wanted to create a kind of video AIDS quilt to, uh, to have people just for a few minutes stand up and say, I have lymphedema. Um, I have lymphedema and I developed it in both arms um, shortly after a double mastectomy. Um, I didn't realize at the time how difficult it would be to find treatment. Um, my surgeon was very focused, as he should be, on curing me of cancer, as he told one of my family members, if I didn't survive, lymphedema wouldn't be an issue. Um, so it took a bit of time to find Dr. Eicher and uh, to get treatment, although I was very lucky. Um, and Allie, I commend you for all of your remarks today. Um, you said many things that I wanted to say and more, so I want to uh, talk to you later about your advocacy because I think you're much further along than I am. Um, lymphedema, um, or LE as we call it, um, and we refer to ourselves as limpies, um, <laughs> We, it's incurable, and it causes painful and disfiguring swelling throughout the body. It's caused by fluid buildup due to damage in the lymphatic system. And my LE is, is uh, not so noticeable because I was able to find and afford the treatment right away. I don't have to worry about insurance like so many millions of others do. Um, but I am at risk for cellulitis, um, as all uh, people who suffer from LE are. And uh, I was, in fact, hospitalized where I was so surprised. I thought, oh, well, it's just in my arms. But suddenly, I had a big red spot on my forearm, and I had to go into the hospital for treatment. The doctors there didn't know what the heck it was, and they started treating me for all kinds of exotic you know, diseases and infections. And I got very ill after one of their experimental antibiotics. So, so much for that. Um, 10 million Americans suffer from lymphedema. That's more than MS, muscular dystrophy, ALS, Parkinson's, and AIDS combined. But nobody knows about lymphedema. And incredibly, during four years of medical school, doctors spend an aggregate of 15 to 30 minutes on the lymphatic system. Primary care physicians are a patient's first line of defense. So when they fail to diagnose lymphedema, thousands of those with lymphedema suffer needlessly, and I'm not exaggerating this, for years, while they try to go from doctor to doctor to doctor. And unfortunately, the disease progresses through its more severe stages, um, where the skin becomes very hard and the swelling much more severe. Um, Often doctors uh, view lymphedema as merely cosmetic, and it's not fatal. But the lymphatic system is compromised, and infections can lead to more serious complications, like sepsis, which are life-threatening. Becoming the spokesperson for the Lymphatic Education and the Research Network three years ago at times has been very frustrating because there's so much lack of knowledge in the public and especially the medical community. But we receive emails from Limpies from all over the work now. We, world now. We have um, nine chapters here in the United States. We even have a chapter in India. We have uh, three international chapters. People are beginning to hear about us, and it's very rewarding to read those emails, and it gives us a sense of hope. They suffer daily often with terrible physical and emotional pain. But as Argentinian composer Osvaldo said, it's a paradox. By trying to kill the human spirit, the answer of the human spirit is to revenge with beauty. And as I meet these people, one after another, to me, they're beautiful in the way they have faced this disease with courage and have encouraged others who face this disease with their inspiration, with their words, and with the way they live their lives. 
So I wanted to just share a few of those stories with you today. There's so many people I could tell you about, and I wish I could tell you about all of them. But um, one of the first we met was Andrew Mata. Uh, he's from Ontario, and he was studying to be a pharmacist. He was very young, in his 20s, and he woke up one morning, and the, his ankle was swollen the size of a grapefruit, and he didn't know what the heck was wrong with him. And <clears throat> he spent six months crawling back and forth in his apartment and on the computer trying to figure out what was wrong. And finally, he discovered that it was lymphedema. And he went to Italy for a, uh, an experimental operation. And at the end of that excruciating experience, they told him it would take five years to know whether it was effective or not. But his painful journey has given him the gift of being acutely sensitive to human beings that he meets in his work. And for example, there was a woman who used to come into the pharmacy, because he did become a pharmacist. and he. He manages his lymphedema by wrapping his leg every day. And there was a woman who used to come in the pharmacy that drove everybody crazy. She was irritable, she was rude, she always had a chip on her shoulder, and nobody liked her, they dreaded serving her. And one day, Andrew met her, and he began to talk with her, and lo and behold, he discovered she was suffering from lymphedema. And when he shared her story, when he shared his story with her, it, it was like this carapace fell away from her and who she really was emerged. And she was able to share with him the pain that she was going through and he was able to empathize with her and it changed her life. Um, he is our co-chair now in Ontario for LEARN and before our first 5K walk run in Venice three years ago, Andrew sent me a smiling photo and a message saying, today we are about to change the world. And I hold on to that message. Pearl Ann Hines is a young dancer who developed LE in her leg about the same time she was in her 20s. And that's devastating to a young woman anyway, but certainly a young woman who is a dancer on the brink of realizing her dreams. But after months of being too embarrassed to dance, she came forward and with friends choreographed a dance on YouTube called Hello World. She says, quote, if I continue to hide the reality, the power to change the legs of future generations would be lost. Tatyana Karolkova, uh, 28, she got off a plane in Russia with a swollen leg. And that began her journey with Ellie. She wrote to us saying, I've seen a doctor here in Russia who told me the disease is not so bad since one is not dying from this. There was a doctor who called me selfish for thinking about yourself only when there are people living without arms or legs. And he told me to leave his office as he doesn't like people who cannot appreciate their happiness. Tatiana said, a person may not be dying, but they may suffer a lot anyway. Marie Apodaca was diagnosed with LE, but it took a decade. She was always heavy since childhood, and she went from doctor to doctor because her legs were so swollen and painful. All the doctors told her, eat more salads. Finally, one day, a coworker accidentally hit the back of her calf with the corner of her box, and she went to the restroom because her back of her pants were soaked, and she was surprised to realize it wasn't blood. There was a clear liquid coming out of her legs. But when she, um, then, then she began to find the right doctor and the right treatment, and it took quite a long time. And it, at one point, she had, uh, there was such a dif difficult infection in her leg that there was some question of whether she could save it or not. But she did, and she still suffers from lower extremity LE, but she refuses to be interred, deterred, <laughs> or interred. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell you, at 68, I am definitely turning into Miss Malaprop. I really am. <laughs> no kidding. Um, incredibly, though, she has now become a fan of 5K walk runs. I went to one with her. I couldn't make it. <laughs> I'll just be honest with you. She made it there and back. She was the last one, but and now she does them all the time. And she began a learn chapter in Colorado and has become an incredible advocate for us. We took her to meet Dr. James Madara, who unfortunately couldn't be here, who got snowed in in Chicago, but uh, 
we took her with us and she made quite an impression on him and she is a true, true advocate. David McDowell, who is uh, the CEO for AOL, sent us this story about his daughter and I'm gonna just read his story here for you. His daughter Colette was born on May 17th, 2016 and two weeks before she was uh, born, they learned that Colette had fluid accumulating in her lungs, abdomen, and skin. His wife was admitted to the hospital so that doctors could monitor Colette around the clock. Later, we learned that the cause of the fluid is a rare disease called pulmonary lymphangiectasia, mm. basically a leaky lymph system mm. in her lungs. Until recently, that diagnosis was considered to be near universally fatal. We were told that if we brought Colette home, the best way we could hope was for a long-term oxygen support. After 114 days in neonatal intensive care unit, including 38 days on a ventilator, Colette came home. She defied the odds and required no oxygen support of any kind, other than a careful diet, use of an inhaler, and regular medical appointments. Colette is thriving at home with her brothers. The doctors and nurses on our team refer to Colette as a miracle in the literal sense of the word. Nothing is promised, he says, but we are blessed to be where we are, and I know love and prayer had a lot to do with that. Finally, there is someone who is my personal hero. Eight-year-old Emma Detlefson has Ellie in both legs since birth. In her eight years, she has been hospitalized many times for infections, testing the strength and courage of her loving parents, Tiffany, Nick, and her brother, Jacob. They have had difficulties with insurance as well. There is an insurance bill in Congress now for compression garments. We are waiting to see if that comes through. She has learned from an early age to quote her, to quote Emma, to always be brave. She is Learn's youth ambassador. She has appeared at the New York State Legislature to lobby for research, prompting both houses to pass the bill uh, immediately. And now if Governor Cuomo would only sign it, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I hope this is going <laughs> out over the waves, sign the bill, Governor Cuomo, <laughs> sign it. Okay, you don't want me to go all Annie Wilkes on you. <laughs> However, all of this has not stopped Emma from becoming the New York State Youth Ambassador for LEARN. She raises funds for research, and she has proved herself a most powerful public speaker for our cause. Her bravery and out outspokenness inspires all of us with lymphedema to put our physical and emotional pain aside so that we can address the challenges in front of us. Last year, at seven years old, Emma addressed the crowd at the New York Walk to Fight Lymphedema and Lymphatic Diseases. She ended her remarks with a call to action, saying, quote, if I can do something hard, like walk back and forth the Brooklyn Bridge, maybe a smart scientist can do something hard for them and find a cure for this in my lifetime, mm -hmm. close quote. Emma and her family are here with us today. I'd like them all to stand and be recognized. And Emma, I would love for you to come up and say a few words to everybody, if you feel like it. I don't know if you're able, going to be able to reach the microphone, so you may have to. Oh, no, I can put it right. Yeah. Everybody, this is Emma Detlefson. Would you like to say something to everybody? Find research. <laughs> Work really hard on research and on helping us find funding. What did you tell 
Um. <laughs> um. Would you like me to say that for you? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So Emma and I um, would like for you all to spread the word about lymphedema um, and to help us recognize how difficult it is for millions to come out of the shadows and even say they have this disease. I'm so proud of you, Emma, and everything that you've done. And Emma would like to say we need all of you to help raise funds for research. And both of us, I think, hope that one day, Mary Woolley, we would like to be sitting here on this panel and give you some good news, like Allie and Dr. Gibson, was it? Or and I'm going to meet all of you later <laughs> um, because I would like to learn to pick up the phone and call insurance companies like you've done so that we can make some real progress and also with research. Thank you so much for ha having me here today. Thanks.